Today, we are joined by two of my favorite people to listen to, quite frankly. Matt Brunig, a lawyer by training, is the founder of the People's Policy Project, a progressive think tank which focuses on socialist and social democratic economic ideas, a large chunk of which Matt dedicates to analysis of the welfare state. Matt and his wife also host the Low Effort and Low Quality The Brunigs podcast, which you can find on their Patreon. Yarn Brook received his doctorate degree in finance from the University of Texas, later working as a finance professor before co-founding BH Equity Research, private equity and uh, hedge fund management company. Yarn also serves as the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute and as the host of the Yarn Brook Show, which you can find on his YouTube. Matt and Yarn, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having us on. Thanks for having me. For sure. Yarn, let's go ahead and start with you. In about a minute or so, does society have a moral obligation to assist non-workers and the poorest among us by providing them collective resources through the state? Is this morally justifiable? And after Yarn is done, Matt, go ahead and jump in with your opening response and rebuttal, and then you're both free to go back and forth as you see fit. Yarn? So, no, um, it, it, it does not. Indeed, I believe that uh, society providing uh, welfare to uh, to a segment of its uh, citizens is immoral, not just is it not moral. But what is what is morality and what does morality apply to? Morality is fundamentally a, a, a set of ideas, a set of principles that applies to individual behavior. Uh, that which furthers an individual life is the good. That which uh, threatens it, that which uh, suppresses it is bad. The major way in which we as human beings survive, the major way in which we thrive, that therefore uh, the primary value and virtue uh, in morality is reason and rationality. It's the use of our minds. It's use of our minds to guide our actions in pursuit of those values we need in order to survive, to thrive, to flourish, to do well. That's what the good means. We deal with other people as traders. We trade with them. We, we provide them with values. They provide us with values value for value in win-win uh, transactions and win-win uh, relationships. Force, coercion, which is necessary if you are going to provide a welfare state. That is, it's necessary if you're going to take money from me and give it to Matt. That requires force. I'm not, you know, if I give it voluntarily, then it's not a welfare state. That requires a coercion. That requires force. Force and coercion are antithetical to human life. They are, uh, they are uh, you know, constraints and ability to think and act based on our own judgment, which is what is necessary for human life, for flourishing human life to be successful. Freedom, freedom from coercion, freedom from force, freedom from uh, authority that imposes itself on us is the essential requirement in a social context for individuals to thrive and be successful. So morality demands that I be left free, free from somebody else's coercion. If I choose to help person X, that is my choice. It might be rational. It might not be rational, but that is up to me. To be coerced into helping uh, another human being is morally evil. It is morally wrong. Uh, and uh, therefore, welfare as a system, a system of coercion, a system that imposes the will of the majority, the authoritarian in charge. Uh, I mean, the welfare state ultimately was established by authoritarians, uh, and it has its uh, authoritarian roots in 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 uh, in in, in history. Um, is a violation of my uh, of my freedom of my uh, rights, uh, and therefore is fundamentally immoral. I'll stop there. All right, Matt. Welfare is is a lack of freedom. It is authoritarian. What is your response? Yeah, I mean, so this is the um, sort of uh, non-aggression principle style argument against welfare. Uh, the idea here is that uh, the institutions involved in the welfare state, the tax and transfer program, involve coercion and force, and coercion and force are bad. Therefore, the welfare state is bad. The problem, obviously, with this form of argument is that it would apply to every institution in the economy. The economy fundamentally is a way of, uh, of allocating scarce goods, right? Distributing scarce goods. And every distribution you can come up with 
uh, trades off with some other potential distribution, and people disagree about what the appropriate distribution is. And so if you happen to find yourself in disagreement with the distribution that your economy is uh, using, uh, you will always experience that as force or coercion. Whether it actually is for force or coercion requires you to actually dig a little deeper and ask yourself, what are people owed? Right. So let me let me take a step back here and make the argument that uh, under uh, Mr. Uh, Brooks, sorry, Brooke, Brooke. Uh, but, uh, under Mr. Brooks um, uh, reasoning here, if, if you don't Yarn, mind. Yarn's uh, argument here would knock out property itself, right? So let's take a step back. Uh, in the beginning, uh, nothing is owned, obviously. Uh, it just exists in the world. No one has owned anything. Um, and then at some point, something becomes uh, becomes owned, by which it means that you can use violence to expel other people from it. That's force and coercion. If those people don't agree, then you use violence to enforce that upon them. So if we were to you know, take this to its logical end, then, then just uh, the institutions of property themselves need to be discarded. They are antithetical to human life. Um, you know, I don't know where else he wants to go with it, right? But like, if, if that's the, the path you want to go, you basically are just going to annihilate everything. I think what happens in this debate, and I don't want to jump, jump the gun too much here, is we're going to end up debating about entitlement. So what Yaren will, is probably doing here, just because I've seen this a hundred times, is he has a certain sense of what people are entitled to. And then anything that deviates from that, the institutions that are used to enforce that deviation is seen as violence and force and coercion. But people disagree on what people are entitled to, right? So in the same way that he might see the welfare state as force and coercion, I would see a lack of welfare state as force and coercion. Why? Because a lack of a welfare state requires the use of force and coercion to prevent people from getting what they are entitled to. So, I mean, I guess what I would say is we need a little bit more from saying it involves force and coercion, right? Or maybe, maybe Yarn and I can join hands here, and the first thing we will do is we can repeal uh, uh, all the property laws and contract laws across all the countries of the world and uh, make sure that no force is involved in the uh, administration of those particular institutions and then see what happens. That would be full human flourishing uh, because there would be the lack of force and coercion that Yarn uh, uh, says is so key. Yeah, I've seen uh, Matt make this argument before that it's, uh, it's the property owner that is coercing me by forcing me to pay a dollar for an orange at a store. Our property rights themselves coercive and we're ultimately just making sort of moral intuitive choices with how we arrange the market. After you answer that, Yarn, go into the back and forth, guys. I'll leave it to you for the next hour. Of course not. I mean, it's a ridiculous argument. It, it, it assumes that property just exists. That it comes into being. And, and the whole definition of the economy is a wrong definition of an economy. An economy is not concerned with distributing scarce goods. That is a fallacy. Goods don't just exist. They don't just happen to be around us. Goods are produced and created. Somebody has to act in order to produce goods, in order to create stuff. Life is a process of action. Life is a process of production. And if you don't produce, you, you have nothing. You literally have nothing. So um, life, so, so an economy is the process of production and trade. That's what an economy is. And that's what economy studies. Economics is the field that studies uh, production and trade. Uh, so, uh, you know, so where, do property, where does property come from? Property doesn't just come from, uh, it's not a starting point. Property is that which one produces that which one gains through one's own effort, through one's own work. That is, property is a product of a human mind, human action, the human need to survive and to thrive and to flourish. There is no flourishing without property. There, is no, there are no goods without property. The goods are the things that are being produced. And therefore, if you abandon property... Well, what you get is anarchy, which is, I guess, Matt is what he supports. But what anarchy is, is what the common person knows what anarchy is. Anarchy is a state of war. Anarchy is a state in which there are no goods, or if there are goods, the force is being used between individuals in order to partake in that property, and gangs roam around stealing from one another, and that is human existence. The idea of property rights 
is a massive human achievement. And it, it is an achievement that brings us stability and peace and, it's an, and, and progress and, and, uh, and creativity. It's an achievement that at some level, some implicit level, almost every society has. And it, once uh, the society has an advanced conception of property, as Western societies have had, at least since John Locke, uh, that leads to massive economic growth and massive economic prosperity. And, and everybody, everybody, literally everybody is uh, uh, better off. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not concerned about entitlement. I'm concerned about property. I'm concerned so about creating and building and making and achieving. So, so goods and services are produced, certainly. Um, but that's a different thing from property, right? Property no. is the institution that's used to this, to say this belongs to this person, this belongs to that person, right? Yeah. If I produce something, it doesn't necessarily mean that I get to exclude it from other people. That's an institution. Now, maybe you agree with that institution, but I the, the jumping off point for the debate was you saying you're against force, you're against force, you're against force. Right. Well, I mean, quite, quite, quite obviously, if I... Quite obviously, if I if I go walk into uh, the grocery store over here, I yeah. pull something off the uh, off the the shelf. I walk on out. Not what, and then someone tackles me. You stole this. Well, who's done the force? I've not you done have. any force. I haven't touched anybody. Of course you have. They touched you, me. Of course you have. They who did I who did I use force on? I mean, it is funny to assume that force only entails touching one another. Uh, there are many ways in which we can force one another. Force and what tail. did I force anyone to do? Any human being to do? I didn't tell anyone yeah. to do anything. I didn't threaten anyone to do it. I literally just moved an object. Yeah, no, not a person. Yeah. Not a person. Just an, an object. object that wasn't yours. You, you, you're inverting high up. Why here. wasn't it mine? Putting logical high. The law, you right? Produce- the force of the state. You didn't produce it. Forget the law. You did not okay. produce it. So it's All not right, you. So that- I grew the orange. Wait, wait, wait. I grew the orange. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oranges, because I grew the orange and I've accumulated oranges. They are my oranges. This is the origin of property. The origin of property is something I produced and now I get to control. When you take something of mine that I produced, you are using force against me. So you see how we've moved into entitlement here, right? So first it was I'm against force, I'm against coercion. I give you an example. Where, in a kind of literal sense, I didn't use any force, but the property enforcer used force against me. And then you go, oh, that's not actually force, because it was forced, used in a way that is consistent with my theory of entitlement. What's my theory of entitlement? My theory of entitlement is, if you produce it, it belongs to you, and you can use force to keep everyone else away from it. So force and coercion has fallen out. It's not a theory, we have a of, theory of entitlement. The fact. theory of entitlement is a is a dessert based theory of entitlement that says if I produce it, it belongs to me, and that's okay. And I'm happy to shift in there. I'll let you talk here, but that is set, force and coercion is gone. You're just saying, just like everyone else, you're willing to use violence to make sure that people get what they are owed. You have a certain sense of what they are owed based on this dessert based theory of if you produce it, it's yours, and then that that's it. Right. But then we will go into that question of whether that dessert based theory is a good one. But I'll let you talk. Dessert based theory is the only theory there is. Every other theory is a theory uh, that negates morality. So, again, if you set up morality as uh, that which is required for human life, for individual human life, if you set up morality as to in order to in order to survive as a human being, one needs the thing can produce and uh, that the product of one's labor is one's own. That is the essential, that is the essential parameters of a moral code. Uh, once you ignore that, then morality is out the window. It's a really then, quick... then it really becomes, then it really becomes force. Who has the bigger guns? Who has the bigger g- gang? Who has the biggest majority to force one group to give to another or to distribute wealth or to distribute anything based on the arbitrary decisions of whomever? That is a violation of morality. I thought we were talking about morality here. Yeah, so, yeah, we are, we are. So morally, morally, what I produce is mine. That's it. Okay. There is no entitlement. Yes, there is just a fact of reality that this thing, this until, you know, until I grew the oranges, there was no oranges. Those oranges, mm-hmm. the, the essential uh, uh, meaning of ownership is those are mine because really, I produce. Really There's nothing for, more to that. Really quick for the people in the audience. Um, yeah. Because... Um, 
just to insert a quick explanation. So essentially what Yaron is saying is that, uh, and how it links to the welfare debate is that in order to have welfare, you essentially have to have taxes, right? And so when you tax people, you're taking their property and sort of redistributing it to other people. And that's where the example of, you know, taking an orange from a store without the consent of the owner comes in. Like fundamentally, can you do that? Can you take someone's property and distribute it to someone else using the coercion of the state? Um, just an explanation for the audience. Matt, what's your response? It doesn't have to be coercion of state. The, the store owner can stop you. And indeed, uh, you know, what this leads to is, of course, a, a state of, as I said, violence uh, by everybody. Because once you enter a store and take an orange, you are starting force. And force will be met with force. Yeah, so I, I just, for clarity purposes, and I'm going to go into dessert, I just want to reiterate it here. There's some conceptual confusion here where you are defining force by referring back to your theory of entitlement. I know you don't like that word, because you, but your theory of dessert. Of, You're saying of, force is anything that... Force is anything that is contrary to my theory of dessert-based distributions. No, and in that case, get rid of the force stuff, right? Just fundamentally, if I go grab an orange off a shelf, that is not force. Unless we read into the word force, Yarin's entire theory, entire theory of property and who and what belongs to who, right? <laughs> Only if we do that. In which case, that's fine. But then let's go back into the the lower level argument about property and what belongs to. So I want to take this orange example. Okay. So we want to say each person is owed what they produce. This is the sort of labor dessert idea. No, okay? I mean stop this. Stop this. A second. Nobody owes anything to anybody. I don't. I, nobody owes somebody. So it is moral and just for each person to get what they uh, produce. Let's put it that way. Okay. Here we go. So how do we know what each person produces? Now, we have, um, you're, you're an economist. You are, 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 you're somewhat similar. I don't know exactly. But you, you know about the production function, right? We've got uh, a lot of inputs go into to output. And one of those inputs, of course, is, is nature. And the orange tree is a good example of this, right? we got the sun... We got water, we got soil. Uh, none of that is produced. That actually is what then goes in and makes the material of the orange. All physical items are made up of material that no human being produced. So who is entitled to those physical items? Now, I know you're going to say, hey, we add value. We add value on top of the basic raw materials. Sure, okay, fine. But the raw materials still are there. I don't consent to you being able to use those raw materials. You didn't ask me. And so not, how can you be entitled to them? You don't produce them. But they're not yours. They, 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 well, they're not mine. They're not yours. It's as uh, a Proudhon says. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they should go. They should belong to their producer. Who produced them? God. <laughs> Therefore, proprietor retire. Right. That was the whole sort of Christian idea at the time. Right. But um, Not a Christian. I don't believe in God. That, I, I understand. But you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. You don't produce any of the material uh, substrate that goes into any of the stuff, and therefore, by what right do you exclude me from that? You didn't produce it either, and I've taken the material of reality and I've reshaped it to produce something new. Something but I don't want. I don't want you to have the input. I don't even want you to have the input. I want to use it, but, but, but I can't now because now you've put it into a, a tree, a house, or something. Sure. You can. You can deny me the inputs, and we go to war, and whoever wins will have the inputs. I mean, that's you've you've relegated human oh. beings. To level, you've relegated human beings to the level of animals, where we are. We, where we are challenging now. I, I, the way I define inputs is the way I gain ownership over inputs is by using them. Once I use those inputs, they become mine. And once that's, that's the way we define a property over land. Once I fence it off and cultivate it, it becomes mine. It is the cultivation. It's the use of those inputs that makes those inputs mine and no longer and no longer it's, yours. And suppose it, I disagree. Suppose I disagree. I say, Hey, Hey, no, no, that's that's and not we, your input. Like, uh, let's give land a, a good example here. You start growing stuff on it, and I come and with my buddies, and we start playing frisbee. And you say, "Hey, you can't play frisbee here. It's my land." And I'm like, "Well, says who?" 
They're like, well, I started using it. I'm like, I don't care. I've, I've always been playing. I wanted to play Frisbee here. You did, it's, did you make the land? No? Okay, so what's the deal? But and all not. you have in response is you go, well, if we don't just basically just pretend that whoever used it first has some entitlement to it, then it'll cause lots of conflict. Sure, right? We all have to go along with rules in order to avoid conflict. But what is the, what is the moral reason why? Moral reason. Which no human being created. Moral reason. You get to exclusively use it. And if I go and just dare to walk on it, you get to violently attack me. I, 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 took, I took these resources and I reshaped them. I did something with them. That makes them mine. That is and what I disagree. That's what you, and you disagree, and therefore we will fight over it. And if but, we. But, can, but notice, notice the. Notice. We can form a society. We can form a society in which we can agree that what is mine, what I create is mine, and what you create is yours, then we are in a society in which we're in constant warfare. And I would argue that the welfare state is, is to some extent, to some extent, such a society. We're in constant warfare because we've, we've not accepted what's mine, mine, and what's yours, yours. And we're constantly trying to convince enough people to vote to take your stuff and give it to me and to take my stuff and give it to you. And that's the state of warfare that civilization should be seeking in order to avoid. And the moral claim is that in order to live in society, we have to define rights. I mean, I could say the same. Look, I don't like you. I don't. Let's say I don't like you. You know, I, I haven't met you, but I don't like you. So I decide Probably to shoot you. you. So I decide to shoot you. Sure. So what? Right. So that would be violence against a person, right? And 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 I get you saying, oh well, I don't I don't care. I don't care. Why is violence against a person? Oh, wrong. Right. So well, here. So here's what I want to do. Violence I'm say against a person and violence against the work, the effort, the product of what a person has created. If if we are beings that need to create in order to survive, we can't survive without mm -hmm. creating stuff then isn't the product that I create part of who I am? And therefore, violence against me is the same as violence against the stuff that I created in order for myself to thrive and succeed as a human being. Right, so so people, way, people, you're committing violence against me by stealing my orange because you're committing violence against the stuff that I have created that is necessary for my survival, my thriving. You're threatening my life, and therefore you're inflicting violence on me. So Right, but watch, 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 I can run... Shooting somebody and stealing his stuff is is morally equivalent. Watch, I could take the same premises here, and I can I can reach the same conclusions, right? Okay, you need to produce stuff in order to live, right? Mm -hmm. You need um, uh, natural inputs in order to produce stuff. Therefore, when you go and you unilaterally grab natural inputs and then exclude them from me, you are taking a <laughs> shot at my life. It's Not a gun to the head, but taking the stuff I need to live. This is why, of course, you know, John Locke has his famous proviso, right? You have to leave enough in common for others and so on and so forth, right? That's okay. Um, no, I mean, this is a silly argument. You know, uh, nature exists out there for us to exploit. As individuals, we go out there and exploit it. Some of us do a good job at it. Some of us don't. That's it. And you get there it, first, and therefore I die. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nature. Because you took something you didn't produce. But I did produce it. I reshaped you, that but material. The, the was, input you didn't produce. The input if, you didn't produce. Thing with it, then it's not mine. But once I do something with it, it becomes mine. And it, again, any system that engages this, any Even if system, that kills me. Any, Even if that kills me. Absolutely. Any system that negates that is a system that will kill all of us. And so you can you can kill me by by strategically placing fences. I don't around kill things. But if I were to go in and grab a little ear of corn, dies. Now I'm doing violence to you. No, nobody nobody actually dies from me using resources. You might die because you don't have enough creativity or enough uh, uh, you know uh, motivation or enough energy to actually use the resources available. There is an infinite amount of resources, natural resources in the world. There's no shortage of resources. Infinite. This is why this is why this whole idea of scarce goods is bizarre, right? There's no scarcity. There is abundance, and then the question is, who capitalizes on that abundance and who doesn't? And if you don't choose to capitalize on the abundance, then you suffer the fate you suffer. 
So let me take a step back to the point about rules, right? So here, here's why I push this point so hard, because, you know, your reaction is to say, okay, look, um, if you don't like the fact that I can initially appropriate things that I never produced, which does seem to be a little bit at odds with my whole kind of theory of, uh, you know, moral dessert. None um, of that I said. If you don't like that, right, I'm putting that in parentheses. If you don't like that, Which that is would have a... Is. That would that would have negative consequences because then essentially we would have conflicting approaches. Yeah, yeah. You said, look, we would just be in a, a world of chaos because you would be able to say, hey, that's mine. And I would say, no, it's not. And we would never be able to have disagreements over the, the natural inputs. We would never be able to have agreement over natural inputs. And then it would just be ruinous battle. Right. OK. So this, I think, is one of the sort of first decent arguments for the welfare state, which is. Maybe you come to me and you say, hey, I want to have a thing where first come, first serve. First person on this fertile piece of land, they get to keep it forever. Exclude it from everyone, including people, by the way, who are not even born, who didn't even have a chance to plant their flag. We get to exclude this from them forever. Okay? And I go, I don't know, man. That seems a little much. Did you make that land? No. Okay, I don't know. It seems odd. But here, I'll strike you a deal, okay? Because it's not, I don't want to fight you over this land forever and ever. I think you point out that's a losing proposition for everyone. So how about this? I'll let you appropriate that land. You can, you can produce things, whatever. In exchange, I want to create a rule where, a, a second rule, right? So the first rule is you get, you know, first come, first serve on natural resources. The second rule is we're going to contribute to a general pot, make sure everyone uh, has kind of their basic needs met so that no one dies as a function of that initial exclusion. And then I say, just... Dude, come to me. We'll meet in the middle on this. We'll have a good society. You can have your land. Everyone will be taken care of. And then I won't fight you about it. Yeah, but of course you'll fight me about it, right? Because why would you want that minimal? Why, that minimal is always going to increase. It always has. Uh, oh, we'll you'll demand. We'll fight the particulars, we'll particulars but the basic no. structure we can agree to. We'll constantly, we'll constantly fight. It's, it's, you know, we've done this. This is exactly kind of the trade-off that we have in the world today, and it's a disaster. But um, no, but I, as a you, disaster. You, you, what's striking to me is how obsessed you are with land, and how obsessed you are with this idea that nothing is done on this land. It's some, some kind of natural resource that somebody took. Uh, when when that is all just bizarre, human beings uh, use the land. It is the use of the land. Indeed, we have even today in our laws that if you stop using the land, you abandon the land for a certain period of time. It it anybody could take it, right? It it, it becomes. Do you agree with those laws? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, I think that I think the how the many years we're going to fight forever, Yaren? Is it twenty years, thirty years, forty years of non-use? Oh, God, it's just going to be endless reforms. There, there were a lot. There are a lot of ways. There are a lot of ways in which we can. Uh, th those can be arbitrated, uh, and and those laws are on the book now. So it's it's not like anybody's fighting in this this big uh, this big battles over uh, you know abandoned property, uh, but it, it, it's just a weird obsession. Property, all property, all human creation, everything that's done in the economy, is a matter of taking the atoms that are just there and restructuring them to create new stuff. And uh, that creation, that act of creation, is done by individuals, uh, by groups, uh, with uh, with uh, you know who uh, who have uh, voluntarily consented to work together under certain terms in order to do it. And uh, those are all uh, creations. And once you say, "No, it doesn't belong to anybody. I can just walk in and take it," then you are establishing. You know, just general warfare. And what you want is then to say, look, I could come in and steal your oranges anytime I want, or your iPhones or whatever. I could come in and steal them all the while. I'll cut you a deal. I'm not going to steal your stuff. If you bribe me. I won't, steal you your, I won't steal your orange. Yeah. The, the actual deal is this. You think I'm stealing your oranges? I think you're stealing the land. To settle that, why don't we just let you do the land thing, grow your oranges, but we're going to have a welfare state to make sure that I don't die just because I don't have anywhere to plant my own orange trees. 
there is there is no shortage of land. Where's that shortage of land? God, this country, this country is empty. I mean, the United States of America is an empty country. There's not shortage of land. There's plenty of unclaimed land. Nobody, plenty of unclaimed land. Seventy five percent of the land west of Mississippi is uninhabitable. Yeah, I want some land that I can grow orange trees on. Not you know, orange trees and plenty land. of that land. Uh, you can be innovative. You can innovate irrigation. Uh, there are orange trees in the desert, right, man? You can do a lot of incredible things if you use your mind and you you make an effort to do it. You see, you want you want you want to hand it to you. You want to take my effort. You want to take my creativity and and paras be a parasite off of it. And you, you I want the land handed to you. That le nobody nobody handed me anything. Uh, that leads to you know distrust and a breakdown in society. Now I want to I want to pivot a little bit here. Sorry, go ahead. I think the big, uh, you know, the big social innovation that that has changed the world dramatically is the recognition of property rights, and the recognition of property rights that is a to come up with an actual definition and a system of law around it has been the one thing that has benefited humanity probably more than any other innovation in human history. I do agree that um, having a kind of uh, peaceful system of what we might call property, right, is useful. But I think the welfare state is part of that, right? Like we have an overall system with lots of rules. We've got bankruptcy, we've got securities law, we got corporations law, we got property, we got contract, we got labor, we got, I mean, it just goes on and on. Well, as yeah, part of that overall system, I do think it's a little bit weird. Like you kind of pivot between saying, hey, essentially rule of law is good because it creates stability and reduces conflict and whatever. That's all well and good. And then I say, yeah, okay, so but just put the welfare state in there. And then from there, you kind of, I would say, equivocate on the concept of conflict. It's no longer people fighting, like, literally, you know, fists and guns and stuff. It becomes people fighting, fighting over the parameters of, like, the old age pension and the child tax credit. And you're like, that's just chaos. Oh, my God, what a horrible society. It's like, I don't know, man. It seems okay. The Republicans put out a thing yesterday saying they wanted to reduce reduce uh they wanted to reduce social security benefits a little bit i'm not a huge fan i might go the other way but it's pretty peaceful it goes all right and i will say this as well for property as much as we might want to be like oh well property law is just this kind of settled thing it's its own whole mess i mean i went to law school it's you know there's there's possession there's takings there's uh, you know i mean it's it's a whole bundle of rules i mean even the one we were talking about before with abandoned property how long does that take what constitutes abandoned property you, need, you, you need even have other absolutely but look what you're missing is a key concept and what you're missing is the concept that that Locke started to innovate on and and still needs still needs thinking and innovation and that is a concept of rights that is the context that bridges morality and politics. It is the context that takes moral individuals living, in, living in, you know, separate from one another. And once we enter into society, we need our freedoms protected. And we have basically one right. You have a right to your life. You have a right to make decisions based on your own judgment, free of coercion. I, I can't do that in the world today. I'm coerced by, all, by many of those laws. Um, and the application of rights, the implementation of rights is property. Property is what I do when I act. When I use my judgment to act, it's to create and build property. And without that protected, you're not protecting my life. That is, if that's not protected, then you're violating my life and you're using force against me. You're so, alive, man. You're doing all right. It's not some random set of laws that we just happen to think, oh, well, let's do this. This might work. Let's play with it. No, this is an essential requirement of human life, of human survival. And, it, and it, once we establish that what you create is yours, uh, you know, and, and you build the bankruptcy laws and all these laws around that in order to preserve that in the context of rights, in the context of coercion is not allowed. I cannot shoot you. I cannot take the clothes off your back. I cannot walk into your house and take your television. I cannot do that. Once we establish that, then you have you have problems of let's how do we exactly define property 
and uh, how how long of the abandonment? What's what does bankruptcy look like? And how, how do the how do we settle these contracts related to bankruptcy? But those can all be settled from the perspective of voluntary exchange and can all be thought through and and dealt with. But you have to have as a basis the idea that your life is yours, your body is yours, your soul. You are you own yourself in a sense, right? And what you produce is yours. That's the starting point. If you don't have that starting point, you're back to, you know, let's fight it out. It's such a weird, it's such a weird, uh, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a whiplash to go between <laughs> um, this idea that like you need these core particular principles. And if you have a welfare state, that means you don't have them. And also my life, I can't live it. And it's like, I live in America, man. Like uh, we have the welfare state. It seems pretty relaxed, all things considered, you know, I'm not, you know, to the extent that people are dying, it's, <laughs> it's not because of the welfare state, you know? Well, I don't know. We could, we could talk about that where the people die from the welfare state. I suspect some do, but uh, you know, probably the biggest thing about the welfare state is everything you don't have. Uh, the alternative universe in which there wasn't one and things and there would be a lot fewer poor people and uh life would be a lot better so just still living you know i mean i, I think bankruptcy is actually a good example and i don't I, you know i don't want to bog down in it too much economy, but the mixed economy is a, is a, is an economy that we can all somehow still live but still live it's life. Practice yourself yeah practice I mean, your religion I don't want to, you know, God forbid. Um, but, you know, how you, you're, you're an atheist, I guess, right? Because you're Rand. Absolutely, I'm an atheist. Yeah, yeah. I was an atheist before. But you're I was, cool with uh, other people being religious, I assume. What's that? You're cool with others practicing their religion, I assume. I'm cool with it, but I, I don't particularly admire it or respect it. I, I, I think it's sad. Um, All right. So I let mean, me let me let me let me move just a little bit on the moral question, right? Because we talked so before about kind of first principles of property and whatever. One of yeah. the consequences of your view about dessert, as I see it, is that people who do not currently produce that they uh, they're not owed anything. They're not they have no moral claim over anything, right? Well, at any given time, about half the population is not working. Um, and so what do we, what do we say about their, what they're owed, right? And we're talking mostly about children, elderly people, disabled people, um, students, at home caregivers and the unemployed. That's about half the population. It seems yeah. to me, if you're really hell bent on, you're only owed what you're, what you produce, that that half of the population is not owed anything and and i think that seems pretty immoral and would cause a lot of death and and suffering and misery and maybe we could peg this to the example of someone who was uh severely physically disabled from birth is now let's say 20 years old can't work what do, what do we make of this person so i would start by saying you're not owed anything nobody's owed anything so i don't like the word owed as if there's some collective pool morally, here morally justly whatever you want to you know i use it to, to be that no, but words are important. And owed suggests some kind of collectivistic, uh, somebody is responsible for you. We're, we're each responsible for ourselves. So suddenly parents owe, this is one way, one, one time I'll use this word, uh, they owe their children. They owe their children, uh, you know, to take care of them, feed them, uh, uh, you know, educate them and do the best that they can to make them uh, adults, to turn them into adults. Once they're adults, they don't owe them anything. Why they do they owe them? Why do they, why? Why do they owe them? Into existence. They brought them into existence. There's a moral responsibility once you bring something into existence to take care of it. You can't bring a human, another human being into existence and just to... Um, so why not? It, because by the very act of bringing it into existence, you're taking responsibility over it, given that they can't take care of themselves. So, so there's an implicit contract. There are lots of implicit contracts in life, but w maybe the biggest one is um, is the implicit contract with uh, with the child that you have, and uh, it, it, you're responsible to it. It's not responsible for you. I don't believe children have a responsibility towards their parents, but parents certainly have a responsibility towards their children. So, if we can take the children out of it, take that class out of it, that would be a good beginning. Uh, beyond that. If somebody's born with a, what did you say? What was the example? A severe disability. Severe disability. 
Uh, they have a family that can take care of them. Hopefully, the family likes them and wants to take care of them. Hopefully, they love them. Um, if, and if they don't, if the care family cannot or will not, then there are charities that will take care of them. And if, if they they, we live in a world in which there are no charities that will take care of them, they will die. Um, mm -hmm. The fact that somebody has a disability does not give them a moral claim against my stuff or my life or my time. Right? I mean, one of the things that we ignore is that property, particularly uh, a produced property, is time. When you take, when you tax me, you're taking part of my life. You're taking part of the time that I've spent, and you're you're negating my own effort in my own life. So he doesn't have a claim against me. I mean, I feel sorry for him, and I might help him if he asks for help. But it's up to me whether to help him or not. The fact that he's disabled is not a claim against my life. Now, who else did you use? Elderly people. Mm -hmm. Elderly people should save while they're while they're not elderly, so that they're not impoverished when they're old. Uh, indeed, I think one of the great sins of the welfare state is that it diminishes exactly that. It diminishes that personal responsibility to save for when you're older. Um, who else? People who have accidents, same position as a guy with a disability. Unemployed. What's that? Unemployed. I question why they're unemployed. You know, there was a time in America where you could buy in the private market uh, insurance against poverty. You could also buy insurance against um, unemployment, private insurance against unemployment, insurance against poverty. Uh, so if you, uh, for whatever reason, became impoverished, an insurance uh, policy would kick in. That's a voluntary uh, organization. The people voluntarily either participate or don't participate. It's nobody coming to me and forcing me to take more responsibility over your life. Don't know you. Don't don't care. Um, so, uh, yeah, there, there, there are lots of mechanisms in a free society to deal with people who are uh, impoverished. And, and the reality is that People don't just die, even in a free society with no welfare. So it's interesting, right? So when you're pushed on, okay, when you when you uh, gut the welfare state, um, all these non-workers don't have uh, income or ability to live. You you essentially push towards the idea that well, we will just more or less recreate similar kinds of transfers, but through other mechanisms. I'm and well I will say, just from a from a kind of uh, I don't know voluntary. basic gloss, yeah, it's voluntary, right? Uh, Make a difference. Who so who cares, right? If you're doing the same stuff, who cares whether it's because you're tithing? Are you sending it on a tax off? It seems like a lot of heat Man. for for something that doesn't matter, especially when the welfare state is, you know, a fairly efficient way to get the money you shifted an, around. You have an unbelievable, you know. Uh, uh, look, <laughs> they say, you know, right now the welfare state's fifty percent of my income. There's a lot I could do with that fifty percent of my income. Uh, it, private insurance is a lot cheaper than the welfare state for a variety of reasons. It's a lot cheaper than the welfare state. Charity is a lot more effective and a lot cheaper than the welfare state. Uh, oh, that, no, 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 no. On, 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 a, on a sort of dollar well, basis, uh, like you put a dollar into the... Let, let's avoid the... Because I feel like we're edging towards... We're, we're only fi 15 minutes until the empirical discussion. So okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's right, stick so to the, uh, the morality of giving people things who cannot produce themselves, you know, disabled people, students, things like this. Um, I guess, Yarn, from your perspective, I mean, I think that Matt is um, intuition pumping to some degree, right? That it, intuitively it feels wrong to say that someone who's disabled ultimately might be out of luck if, uh, you know, there's no charity who's willing to bestow upon them any cash. Um, what is the moral basis for, for such a society? But if that, again, the moral basis is, is the, the one I laid out in the beginning, that is the individual, individual morality is to pursue one's own happiness, one's own success, one's own flourishing, one's own survival, using one's mind uh, to guide oneself. Uh, and you deal with other people as traders. You deal with other people value for value. Now, uh, as you said, if, there's, if, if really we all have this moral intuition, which I'm not sure we all have, but if we all have this moral intuition, then... What's the problem? Charity will take care of all of it, right? We all have this. We don't, we don't like to see disabled people dying in the streets, so we'll all pay up voluntarily. You know, and, and, you know, Matt might have a windfall right now, so he'll pay a little bit more to charity, and I might not right now. I might be paying my kids' tuition for whatever, so I might not. Each one of us will make a decision about how important this is and how valuable this is, and I think 
in a decent society, people don't want to see disabled people just dying in the streets. So they would do that. But it would be a lot more effective, a lot more efficient, a lot narrower than a welfare state, which uses I coercion. I found this on the web. Okay, that was, that was Siri objecting to something I said. Um, uh, anyway, so it, 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 is, it is people voluntarily deciding what's important for them or not. But the reality is, and, and this is why I'm, I'm, I'm willing to let Matt push me to say, but what if nobody supports him? Nobody supports him and they die. That's a state of nature. In nature, if you can't take the resources in your surrounding and manipulate them and change them in order to create something new, you die. We all die. Human beings die unless they can do that capability. And, and in nature, if you're born without that capability, you won't survive. The state, the state of nature bit is is really weird, you know, because obviously human beings have ex have existed in uh, sort of groups and societies for forever, right? From from the beginning, and um, human beings have also had this sort of life cycle where they're productive in some years, not productive in other years, and so sort of the whole of human existence inherently involves finding ways to redistribute from people who are currently producing to people well. who aren't currently producing. And it's funny, the way that one of the ways that he tries to get out of the inherent need for that is to say that we have financial technology now that might facilitate those transfers through essentially individual accounts, right? Savings and individual accounts. That was not a thing until very recently. So from a kind of basic moral principles level, it's not plausible to suppose that a basic feature of human morality requires this kind of financial savings of money that can then be disgorged in old age or disability or whatever to cover yourself or sure. insurance or whatever. That did not exist literally until like a couple hundred years ago at the earliest. So we had to forever redistribute from people who are currently producing down to kids up to olds sideways to disabled and unemployed people we had to be doing that forever Just and we have different right. institutions for doing it the welfare absolutely. state we'll get into it is a very effective one but the idea that as a basic moral principle we don't have to do that because in the state of nature that's just how humans are and whatever that's garbage that's the whole of human society is built around spreading it out to everyone because we're not all working all the time i'm going to have about 40 working years and 40 non-working years so the society is going to have to be producing me for me in those 40 non-working years whether we transfer in those years through financial accounts where we pretend i've got money and it's called capital and blah 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 or we do it in a more literal way with tax and transfers it all amounts to the same thing you got to have a system to do it and the welfare state's a, a good way to do it I, I yeah sorry i don't mean to go on but just to bake in the idea that forever and ever if you weren't productive you just died is absurd there would be no human beings if that were the case it's just not true. First of all, life expectancy was pretty short. So uh, when you weren't in your productive years, uh, you, you, you were already dead anyway, right? So uh, a thousand years ago, life expectancy was 29. Even if you survived to age 10, you didn't live beyond 40, 50. Uh, it was very rare for anybody to live into the 60s or 70s. And most of the people who did live into the 60s and 70s had to work because there was no surplus for other people to give to them. Uh, so they actually did work. Uh, children, as I said, even children, by the way, uh, for almost all of human history until very recently worked. They produced. If they didn't produce, guess what happened to them? They died. So, so the reality is they had to produce. Nobody redistributed wealth to the children. The family either uh, took care of the children or, and the children had to work or they starved. So I I indeed, in the state of nature, it's exactly like that. I remember there's a... There's a, I don't know if it's, it's, I think a documentary on Eskimos where the old people, when they discover they're no, no longer productive, go out into the ice and commit suicide because they don't want to be a burden on their kids. Um, this is human society. The, the idea, uh, and, and instead of celebrating the fact that, wow, we have all this technology, this amazing technology that allows us not to redistribute from other people, but to redistribute inside ourselves from when we're young to when we're old, saving. And, and, and we can invest it so it grows. 
And uh, we can buy insurance. Wow, I mean, this is amazing. We should celebrate that. We should be so uh, grateful for that because now, indeed, we can live into old age and we can survive beyond old age. And now we're so rich because of capitalism, because of property rights, because of, 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 uh, of, of the fact that we have private property. Because of that, we can now, you know, uh, give, give uh, help our friends. We can help disabled. We can create charities. Charities existed in the past. Uh, you know, uh, uh, most the church, people, dude. The church. Uh, the church. The church. That was the thing. That, that I don't know what you think tithes were back in the day. Those were those were compulsory. Oh my God! You you read you read the history of the church. I don't think you'd be so positive about it. And, I'm not uh, saying it's good. I'm just saying they had a welfare state that was compulsory through ties. That was that was the game of the church back in the day. It was it was very selectively used and very badly used, just like the welfare state. And it was not large enough. The tithing that came in and the charity they they were much more busy building large cathedrals than they were helping the poor. Because the reality is that human beings were unbelievably poor for mo almost all of human history until very recently. Yeah, so that, overall productivity, yeah. but I'm saying I'm saying what regardless of the overall level of output, there was necessarily redistribution occurring because you didn't have a hundred percent employment. The employment rates, even if you want to add in maybe fewer retirees, it's not like they were running eighty, ninety percent employment rates. That's just not how it how how it played out. I do have a question for you. Do you think children should work or should be able to work? I don't think children should work, but they did should they work. be able to. Should they be legally able to? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think, think they um, shouldn't be, and then I think instead that the <laughs> the rule of the society should be that they should uh, they don't, right? all chip it, in and take care of the kids. Work, you know, children don't work today not because of this uh, of the rules of society. Children don't work today because their parents are wealthy enough so they can keep them out of the fields. They can send them to school. Child labor goes away. Well, the school I, is I, free. I, if it weren't free, I think you'd find many. <laughs> Lower-income parents who might uh, calculate differently. Capital wealth and child labor goes away because now parents can afford to send their kids to school. And uh, afford, they're be, free. They're free, dude. School would be cheaper if it was private. It's not free. Nothing's free, right? You no pay for it. Free. No you pay free. for it. Somebody's somebody's paying for it, right? Nothing's free. As yeah, it said, doesn't cost nothing, but it has no user fee. I, I, if you think someone making, you know, I don't know, 15000 a year, let's say 10000 a year, if the school wasn't free, how would that work for the kid? Oh, God. Well, I think, um, I think again, we're, we might be going into the empirical discussion a bit, but we're in our sure. last five minutes of the moral discussion, so I think this is a good kind of part to round it out, give your last couple of minutes on the morality of the welfare states uh, and go from there. Yarn, since you started, uh, go ahead and start now and then Matt can end us out and then I'll introduce the next topic. He always goes after me? That, that doesn't seem okay. right. I mean, we can, supposed we can, to reverse it. He, he I'm doesn't know sorry. the debate norms. You, you can switch it up. I guess, Matt, you can go first. Then Yarn, you can finish us out. You know, no big deal. Okay, we, so we voluntarily I guess I never come really... to that decision. It does, so I mean, either way, I don't really care. I just thought it was... <laughs> no, he's right. Yarn's right about this. Um, okay, I didn't really ever state kind of the whole thing, but let me, let me uh, yeah, give you a little spiel here, okay? So, um, you know, the economy, I would say, basically is like a government program, more or less, right? We have all these institutions that go into it. We've got bankruptcy. We've got securities law. We've got corporations law. We've got all of this, right? And these institutions fit together. It's not right to kind of pick on a few of them and say, oh, I like property and contract, and then go over here and go, oh, those are an invasion in property and contract. Rather, the whole thing fits together. And I think as we did kind of hit on a little bit in our discussion, these things fit together in a sense that they're necessary in order to kind of get overall agreement and avoid conflict in society. And the principles that uh, Yaron tries to rely upon to say there will be no conflict also just basically require people to just kind of go along with it, even though they may disagree with the idea, for example, that you should be able to own something that you never produced, right? So from a kind of basic start, starting point, we're all creating the economy. The economy has all these different institutions in it. What we have to decide is what do we want those institutions to look like? 
Yaren is really hell-bent on this idea that we need to create these institutions that essentially map onto the idea of making sure each person gets what they produce. I think I've shown over and over again that this is not a coherent idea. Everything you produce has inputs that nobody has produced. People inherit things that aren't produced, et cetera, et cetera. He also will then switch back into saying, no, no, it's not so much that I'm against, uh, uh, it's not so much that I'm hell-bent on production and, and giving people what they produce. I'm, I'm also really super against coercion and force and violence. Every economic institution rely, relies upon coercion, force, and violence. It's all bundled in there. So what we got to ask ourselves is which of these institutions are the best institutions? To me, I'm an egalitarian. I think if you're going to create a set of institutions that distribute sort of wealth and income and power in society, you want to try to do that in the most equal way. And the main reason I, and that I would say is compatible with some of Yarn's thoughts is that the, if you're going to start preventing people from living their life and grabbing things that they need to live, which is what our property system does, you also need to offset that by making sure that everyone is taken care of to some decent extent, right? It would not be fair to violently exclude people from the things that they need to live if you're known also have offsetting institutions. So on a basic moral level, the welfare state promotes equality. The welfare state is fair to those who are excluded from the uh, uh, necessary materials to live. And like yarn, I value life first and foremost, and the welfare state promotes life better than a society with no welfare state. In fact, as much as he starts the whole debate off saying how much he loves life, he has no problem in the end of the debate telling you how many people he is willing to let die. I think that's pretty clear that life is not his main value, that the welfare state is gonna get you the most life. And uh, so, so from a moral perspective, I, I, I would think the welfare state is a, is a, is a better institution than, than the lack of a welfare state. All right, Yaron, your final thoughts, and then we can move to the empirical discussion. Yeah, so the, the, the conceptual confusion here is, is, is massive. Um, to defend my own life is not coercion. Um, and since property is necessary for my life, defending my property is defending my life. And therefore, that act of defense is not coercion. Uh, if you equate defense with coercion, then you lose both concepts. Both concepts are meaningless. Coercion means the initiation of force against somebody else's life or property. Property is part of his life. You can't separate the two. Property is essential for human life, for human progress, for human success. And indeed, the only reason we have so much of the wealth that we have today so that Matt can redistribute it based on his desires is because we have recognized the right for property. Without it, none of the wealth that we have today in the world would indeed exist. So property and all forms of wealth are produced. They're produced by somebody's mind and labor. And if you negate property, you negate wealth, you negate human life, and you negate civilization. Um, so I believe that when we come into a community, when we come into a society, uh, this, we have to create institutions, right? As, as Matt mentioned, institutions that protect individual rights, that protect my, life to, my, my right to life, property, uh, my right to free speech, but let's stick to property, life and property. Uh, and that's basically it in terms of the role our institutions play. Everything else is a consequence of that. Everything else is playing in a legitimate country, in a legitimate government, which I don't think we live in today, um, is just a consequence of playing out the government's responsibility to protect the right to life and the right to property. And the right to life and life to property mean that I have a right to use, again, use my mind, use in pursuit of my values, uh, to use my property as I see fit, free of coercion, free of interference, free of anybody, a majority or minority, telling me what I can and cannot do or taking my stuff. Um, and any institution that exists today that represses that ability doesn't recognize the existence of my property or tries to take it by use of coercion uh, is an illegitimate institution and the welfare state is just one aspect. I mean, the regulatory state is illegitimate. There's a lot of parts of the American state today that in my view are illegitimate, the welfare state being 
one of them. <laughs>